بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا وحبيبنا والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا وحبيبنا أبي القاسم محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين المأسومين المظلومين السلام عليك يا أبا عبد الله وعلى الأرواح التي حلت بفنائك عليكم مني سلام الله أبدا ما بقيت وبقي الليل والنهار ولا جعل الله آخر الأحد مني لزيارتكم السلام على الحسين وعلى علي بن الحسين وعلى أولاد الحسين وعلى أصحاب الحسين السلام عليكم يا شهداء كربلاء ورحمة الله وبركاته سلوات الله محمد وعلى محمد I begin in the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Merciful. I begin in the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Merciful. And all praise belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who says to us in his blessed book, in Surah Al-Ma'oon, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, أرأيت الذي يكذب بالدين فذلك الذي يدع اليتيم ولا يحض على طعام المسكين فويل للمصلين الذين هم عن صلاتهم ساهون الذين هم يراءون ويمنعون الماعون صدق الله العلي العظيم Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Ma'un Ma'un is asking the following Have you not seen those who belie the religion of Allah? Ara'ayta alladhi yukadhibu biddeen Have you not seen those who belie the religion the pretentious ones? And the sign of these pretentious ones He says فَذَلِكَ الَّذِي يَدْعُ الْيَتِيمِ They are the ones who treat the orphans with harshness. They treat orphans with harshness. وَلَا يَحُدُّ عَلَىٰ تَعَامِ الْمِسْكِينَ And they hold back the food for those who are in need. فَوَيْلُ لِلْمُصَلِّينَ Woe to those prayerful ones. الَّذِينَ هُمْ عَنْ صَلَاتِهِمْ سَاهُونَ the ones who pray without any heart in it, they pray without any real heart to submit to Allah. الَّذِينَ هُمْ يُرَاعُونَ They do it to show off. They pretend they want to impress people. وَيَمْنَعُونَ الْمَعُونَ and they withhold the necessities of life. My respected brothers and sisters, tonight is the night in which Imam Hussain alayhi salam's soul, life was taken away back to his master. And when we look at the event of the night of Ashura, meaning the 11th night after Imam Hussain alayhi salam was massacred with his family and his companions, the attitude of those who are in Yazid's army is exemplary according to the Surah Al-Ma'un. Exemplary from the top to the bottom. The Quran sets the standard 
we, the lovers of Ahl al-Bayt, follow the standards. And we recognize where truth lies and where falsehood lies. This is what Allah wants from us. He's testing us to see if we are submitting to the truth or are we submitting to falsehood. Anybody who claims that those caliphs were good, they're in violation of these verses of the Quran. For you see that in the night after Imam Hussain alayhi salam left this world, massacred, they trampled his body, they even stripped the clothes that he was wearing, though the clothes that he wore, he tore them before he wore them. That upon wearing it, he tore it so that there should be no value to this. But an Imam who is so precious, one who is so strong, so indomitable, when the enemy wants his head, even a piece of his hair has value. So they tore his clothes. They tore his body. They took his head out of his body. And they placed it on a spear. Historians say that Imam Zain al-Abideen salam was very ill, lying in his tent, unable to respond, to go and help. Because Allah also decreed his imamat, that Allah wants to continue the imamat, nurun ala nur, yahdi allahu li nurihi man yasha. Allah says, Fi buyutin adin Allah an turfa'a wa yudhkara fi hasmu yusabbihu lahu fiha bil ghuduwi wal asal rijalun la tulhihim tijaratun wala bay'un an dhikrillah. Meaning that our Imam was kept as a continuity. And Imam Zain al Abidin, while he's in the tent, he hears a commotion, a lot of horses trampling, screaming noise, and he pulls the curtain from the tent from his state of illness, and he sees his father's head on the spear, and he says, Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'un. This is an emotional night and I have much to express because tonight is our last night. We're going to go back into our lives and I want to maximize tonight. I want to send a clear message for what we should be doing as lovers of Ahl al-Bayt after having heard all the stories of Karbala and after having seen the treachery of the enemies. What are you and I going to do about it? What is our obligation as Muslims about it? Why did we spend these 10, 12 nights together? Why is it so important for us to spend these nights together? What is the reason behind it? What is the carry over with The reason we speak about Imam Zain al Abidin this way and the reason we cry is so that it should be in our hearts all the time. The reason we want to touch hearts, the reason we should cry, the reason we should feel the pain of Karbala, so that in our day-to-day -day lives, when we are given the opportunity to violate Allah's law, tonight, sisters, this is your night. Karbala now moves into the hands of the women. Before, all these nights was in the hands of the men. The women were patient behind, waiting, observing, witnessing, but there is something Allah has blessed women with and that is called patience. Allah says, وَوَسَّيْنَ الْإِنسَانَ بِوَالِدَيْهِ حَمَلَتْهُ أُمُّهُ وَهْنًا عَلَى وَهْنٍ وَفِصَالُهُ فِي عَمَيْنِ أَنِ اشْكُرْ لِي وَلِوَالِدَيْكِ إِلَيَّ الْمَصِيرِ we have enjoined goodness upon mankind. And the mother bears pain upon pain for two years because she's been made to be patient. She has an endurance that even a man cannot submit to. 
When it comes to being a mother of society, I tell you, women have the kind of endurance and patience that I am in awe when I see them. That when children are born, and how mothers endure to keep that child pacified and happy, men cannot do that. I'm sorry. We men, us men, we have a different strength. Sure, we have the power of patience too, but when it comes to certain qualities you examine you see the women have been endowed with this enormous power that after Imam Hussein alayhi salam was massacred it came turn for the women to be patient it came turn for the women to be abused to be pulled out of their tents I will explain that but I want to also explain another message before I get to that forgive me Imam Hussein alayhi salam went to Karbala to save Islam. That means Yazid was going to dismantle Islam. And what was at the core of Islam? Salah. Submission to Allah. Patience, kindness, generosity, good words, wisdom, every quality positive Imam Hussein exemplified. At the day, on the day of Ashura, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exemplifies the character of Imam Hussein alayhi salam in the event of Karbala in Surah 89, Surah Al-Fajr. Surah Al-Fajr, Allah starts, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, wal-fajri, wal-layalin ashr, wal-shaf'i, wal-watr, wal-layli idha yasr, hal fi thalika qasamun lidhi hijr. If you read the spirit of this surah, Allah swears by the fajr, by the time that morning daybreak. Now of course, Mufassireen give Many meanings to this, and it has many meanings, but read the spirit of Surah Al-Fajr cover to cover. Allah Matabatabai in his Al-Mizan fi Tafsir Al-Quran says this surah exemplifies Karbala completely. It is the surah in which it is, exposes Karbala completely. Allah swears by time, by Fajr. He says, Walayal in Ashr, in the ten nights. Of course, those ten nights are the ten nights of Zal Hajjah, but also the ten nights of Muharram. وَلَيَالٍ عَشْرٍ وَالشَّفْعِ وَالْوَتْرِ Odd and even. Two elements meeting. Allah continues. Allah exposes the Banu Umayyah. أَلَمْ تَرَ كَيْفَ فَعَلَ رَبُّكَ بِعَادٍ Have you seen those people who built their homes on big uh, stilts, big pillars? Allah destroyed them. Thamud, how we destroyed them, and Fir'aun, how we destroyed them, and look what Allah says. Same. فَأَمَّا insan. Allah says, how ungrateful mankind is. He says, كَلَّا بَلَّا تُكْرِمُونَ الْيَتِيمِ He says, you don't honor the orphans. وَلَا تَحَادُّونَ عَلَى تَعَامِ الْمِسْكِينَ You know it's the same. Surah Al-Ma'un, it's repeating. Nor do you urge one another to feed. Karbala was exactly like that. وَتَعْكُلُونَ التُّرَاثَ أَكْلًا لَمَّا You eat away heritage. Fatima al-Zahra, salamu Allah alayha, was given her fadak as a gift by the, press, by the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. She bequeathed the entire thing for the benefit of the ummah. But even that she was not allowed to have. They took her heritage. They took it away from her. They hurt her. Allah says, these are the people we are talking about. These, they violate the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَتُحِبُّونَ الْمَالَ حُبًّا جَمَّةً You love the material. You love this world. Umar ibn Sa'ad was promised the governorship. Ibn Ziyad was building a white palace in Basra. White palace. A palace which Imam Hussein alayhi salam says you will not live in it one day. And how so true. For after the event of Karbala, Ibn Ziyad scrambles and goes back to Basra. And he's not able to spend one night in that palace. And he runs. Because after Imam Hussein's shahada in Karbala, after his shahada in Karbala, people begin to realize what Yazid was really made up of. And Imam single-handedly unravels the entire machinations of Muawiyah. But it was the women who played that role. It was the women who rose. Zainab alayhi salam rose. They say, Um Kulthum, Kulthum, she rose. 
Oh, each and every one came forward. Rabab, the wife of Imam Hussein, rose and started speaking. And they say, Ummul Baneen, the mother of Abbas السلام, was alive. Historians say, which is so amazing, that whenever I go to Medina and I go to Jannatul Baqi, she is buried there. And I see visions of a woman, an old woman, strong, holding her grandchildren, who are Abbas salam's children. And she used to bring them to Jannat al-Baqi every day. And she would stand in Jannat al-Baqi and call the people and tell them about Karbala. This is what Umm al Badin did. That's why when I go there, I always honor her. I said, if not for you, maybe we would not have known this great miracle. This great tragedy, women like yourselves have risen. Despite the fact that Marwan ibn Hakam had taken the caliphate at that time, the same Marwan ibn Hakam whose father was exiled, whose father the Holy Prophet condemned. This is the same man who became the Khalifa later in time. And Abu Dhar, who the Prophet said is the most truthful man under the sky, gets exiled into Rabda by the third caliph. This is the kind of breach of justice we're talking about. This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying. You love this world. That they say, Ibn Ziyad, love this world. Umar ibn Sa'ad, love this world. Umar ibn Sa'ad didn't get one day of peace after Karbala. They say, Ibn Ziyad did not get one day of peace. He was chased. He had to hide himself under the belly of camels. And he was chased. And he ran away all the way to Syria, Damascus, to protect himself. And in time when he meets Ibrahim ibn Malik al-Ashtar, Allah Akbar. This is the same Mal'oon who took the heads of Hani ibn Urwa, who took the heads of Muslim ibn Akhil, and he placed it on the doors of the governor's palace. Within a short time, Ibrahim ibn Malik al-Ashtar with Mukhtar al-Thaqafi, they chase him, they kill him, they cut him, and put his head on the same place. And people said, look, yesterday he had people's head, today his head is up there. Allah replies quickly. He says, do not be. لا يحزنك كفرهم إلينا مرجعهم فننبئهم بما عملوا إن الله عليم بذات الصدور نمتعهم قليلا ثم نذترهم العذاب غليظ. Don't be despaired by the kufr of these people. We give them time, and then in time we take them and we punish them with a severe punishment. So tonight is a night of remembrance. It's a night of commitment, brothers and sisters. It's a night of commitment. Commitment in what way? That you and I need to make commitments tonight to say the Muharram has started. Our new year has started. The great tragedy has taken place. Imam Hussein has sacrificed himself because he loves Allah. Because love and sacrifice are synonymous. And I am proud to call myself lover of Ahl al-Bayt. And I am proud to call myself lover of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. But Imam is saying, what's your commitment? What are you going to do this year for me? My sacrifice, the blood I spilled for you to save you. What are you going to do about it? Salah, brothers and sisters. Salah. Imam Hussein, historians say, at the time of Dhuhr, and here's something that I want us to understand. The resolution of these people. The battle started at Fajr time. Wal Fajri wa layalin ashr. It started at Fajr. Umar ibn Sa'ad was anxious and he made it clear that I, Umar ibn Sa'ad, is starting this war. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, and the Holy Prophet of Allah has told us, anyone who starts a war against anyone is mal'oon, is a disbeliever. Because a believer never starts a battle. A believer never starts a war. A believer always responds to a war, never starts it. So anybody who has any doubts about where is haqq and batil, here again, it is conspicuous. And you find Umar ibn Sa'ad, when he starts this battle, it starts at Fajr time. There were 72 warriors who knew how to fight. The rest were young boys and a woman. And you find the battle continued until the time of Dhuhr, brothers and sisters. The battle continued until the time of Dhuhr. Six hours 
How does an army of a minimum of 20,000, if not 30,000, how do you fight for six hours? 30,000 versus 100. How? For six hours. That's the resolution of our blessed Imam. That when he split his army into three parts, three wings, they resisted, they penetrated, they hit, and they killed. They killed. Ya yuhan nabi jahid al-kuffar wal-munafiqeen waghlud alayhim wa ma'wahum jahannam Fight them, these munafiqeen. Kill them and send them to hell. Because they deserve to be in hell. We ask about hell. After seeing this treachery today, we must understand Allah is just, Allah is merciful, Allah is adil. Allah says, in ahsantum, ahsantum li anfusikum. When you do good, you do good for yourselves. That when a person goes to hell, he damned himself to hell. That when Imam Hussain alayhi salam says to Umar ibn Sa'ad, he said, oh Umar, this promise, this Ibn Ziyad and Yazid has given you, it's not going to be fulfilled. You will not get this governorship. None of you will get what you've been promised. None of you. And it's so true in history that within a short span of time, they were all destroyed. Umar ibn Sa'ad was killed, Ibn Ziyad was killed, and Yazid was found dead. He went hunting and his body came back dismembered. Somebody met him somewhere and no one even knows where he's buried today. He, wa he vanished. His father's dreams came to an end because Muawiyah's son, he thought Mu Yazid will continue the progeny. Alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy that Mu Yazid had a son who was Muawiyah the second. That after Yazid's death, you find Muawiyah the second sits on the pulpit and he says, my grandfather was a thief, was corrupt. And my father was a thief and corrupt. And this does not belong to me. This seat does not belong to me. It belongs to Ali ibn al-Husayn Zainul Abideen. And within 40 days, Muawiyah II was killed, was poisoned. And Marwan ibn Hakam takes Khilafah. The same Marwan ibn Hakam, who the Messenger of Allah condemned and exiled. Now let me ask you, what is the value of our Shahadatain? That if the messenger chooses one thing and people choose another, who has greater authority? Allah in the Quran says, An Nabiyu awla bil mu'minina min anfusihim. The messenger has greater right on the believers than the believers have on themselves. So then who, is, who are we to follow? Marwan ibn Hakam? Is there any quality to this caliphate? How can there be quality to such caliphate when we're all loving the world? Imam Ali alayhi salam says, he says, they took my right and they throw it like a ball on each other's lap. Like as if it's a toy to be played with. When this right belongs to me, read the khutbah of Shaykh Shaqiyya in Nahjul Balagha. He said, it is like a bone stuck in my throat to witness this kind of zulm taking place. Today, the carnage that's taking place in the world, the kind of ignorance that is pervasive in the world is precisely because of this. Because shaitan knows where the problem lies. And he's exacerbating it. He's hitting it. So tonight... After the shahad of Imam Hussein, we want to make it clear to let the world know where haq lies. And you and I, my brothers and sisters who are the Shia, are the ones with the sweet tongue. Imam Hussein salam, was once on a horse. I want us to remind us. He was once on a horse and a man vilified him. He stepped down. He looked at the man and he said, you look tired. Come to my house. Come and have lunch. Rest a little bit and then we can talk more. Can you find people who talk like this? Kind speech. Our Imam has said when a man abuses you, punish him. How? By being kind to him, by forgiving him, by being better than him. This is the quality of our Imams. This is the quality we're talking about. So Allah says, You love this world, you have a love for this world, but you can't get it. You won't get it. I read history. And I put my, ha my hand on my head and I said, what a fool, Umar ibn Saad. What a fool you were. You thought you were going to get your dreams. You not only lost this dunya, you lost akhira. Look what Allah says. Kalla idha dukkatil ardu dakkan dakka wa jaa rabbuka wal malaku saffan saffa. Wa jia yawma idhin bi jahannam. Yawma idhin yatadhakkaru al-insan. The same Umar ibn Saad will say, 
Ibn Ziyad will say, قَدَّمْتُ لِحَيَاتِي I wish I could come back. Allah says, too late. You are so wicked. They say Ibn Ziyad was so wicked. His father was a wicked man. He was an illegitimate child, born out of illegitimate birth. You see, indecent lifestyle. When women and men indulge in indecent lifestyle, we produce such children. They go out and butcher and murder. That's why this hijab is so important. That's why the man's hijab is so important. Decency, submitting to Allah is so important. We bring beautiful children into this world. We leave a legacy behind. We'll talk about hijab, sisters. Tonight, it's very important for us to all reflect. يَقُولُ يَا لَيْتَنِ قَدَّمْتُ لِحَيَاتِي فَيَوْمَئِذٍ لَا يُعَذِّبُ عَذَابَهُ أَحَدٍ That day, you can't divert it. It's too late. Too late. You've been warned. أَلَمْ يَعْتِكُمْ نَذِيرٌ قَالُوا بَلَا قَدْ جَاءَنَا نَذِيرٌ فَكَذَّبْنَا وَقُلْنَا مَا نَزَّلَ اللَّهُ مِنْ شَيْءٍ إِنْ أَنْتُمْ إِلَّا فِي ضَلَالٍ كَبِيرٍ This is what Mu'awiyah used to say. Muawiyah used to say, and his father, Abu Sufyan, used to say, this messenger of God claiming to be a messenger, claims that he's receiving revelations from God. There are no revelations coming. This was the very man who had crosses in his, in his home when he became the governor of Damascus. And he had a passion for Circassian women, European women. And he loved the Christians. This is Muawiyah, whose father, Abu Sufyan, goes to the grave of Hamza and he kicks the grave of Hamza and says, your fathers fought with my fathers in Badr. Today this religion is in my hand because his sons have become governors of Damascus and he's already trenched himself. He's already entrenched and he's got power. And this is why we see today, brothers and sisters, we have to understand what it means. Who are the enemies of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? I conclude. Look at how Allah ends this surah. You notice the entire surah, condemnation, warning, Fir'aun, ungrateful, people going to hell. They'll be seeking to come back. Allah says, too late. You notice, what a consolation. When I read Surah Al-Fajr on the day of Ashura, it consoles me. For Allah says, Ya Hussein, you are among, the, clearly the leader among those who are the patient ones, like Ismail, when Ibrahim says to him, that I see that I need to slaughter you. He says, if'al. Do it, what you've been asked. Satajiduni, insha'Allah min as-sabirin. Insha'Allah, Allah will find me among the patient ones. I tell you, Allah says, wa bashir as-sabirin. Al-ladina idha asabat hum musiba, qalu inna lillah wa inna ilayhi rajiun. Imam Hussein was walking back and forth. Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi rajiun. You and I, lovers of Ahlul Bayt, should be patient people. We should be with inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun. We must not be afraid of oppressors. We must rise in any way possible, whether it's with the pen or with our money or with our intelligence. But the first thing we need to do, brothers and sisters, is unite. Forget this Iraqi, Iranian, Koja business. These are secondary issues. Our primary is Islam. In the deen and the light Islam. Our role and duty, brothers and sisters, that Allah has honored us is our Islam. Sure, our nationalities are important. Our cultures are important, but they are secondary. This is so beautiful when you see a crowd mixed with all types of people because we are all moving in the same direction, remembering the same principles because we are united at that level. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is showing us in the Quran the attitude of who Imam Hussain alayhi salam was, the patient one. The one who suffered, the one who struggled, the one who had vision, the one who sacrificed the highest form of sacrifice so that you and I should use it to change our, ourselves. Allah says, on that day there shall be no one to stop and avert this punishment. Then Allah turns to Imam Hussein and his likes. Although this surah was revealed before Imam Hussein's shahada, but who said the Quran does not speak about future events? Hmm? And who said the Quran is only practiced in the time of the Prophet? Every day, examples of the Quran come alive to us. But who can supersede the example of Karbala in Surah Al Fajr? Who can supersede it? Tell me. You can't find it. Allah says, Ya ayyatuhan nafsul mutma'inna. This is the time when Imam was in sujood. 
He loved to worship his Lord. Salah. Ibrahim says what? Rabbi ja'alni muqima salati wa min dhurriyati. Rabbana wa taqabbal dua. Rabbi ja'alni muqima salati wa min dhurriyati. Oh Allah, make me among the prayerful ones and my children. Imam Hussein fights until the hard time. Abu Thamama, who was a companion in Karbala, is waiting with the Imam. It's Salatul Dhuhr. Salah time. Listen to what Quran says. He says, Inna salata kanat ala al mu'minina kitaban mawquta. Mawquta meaning it's a prescribed time. Imam Khomeini rahmatullahi alayhi says, every time of salah, the prayer comes down and he stands in front of you and it becomes your guest at the waqt of salah. And it waits for you to welcome it. It waits and if you ignore it, it goes back to its Lord, complaining that I went as a guest to be an intermediary for this being. He ignored me. Salatul waqt al salah, meaning at the time of salah. Imam Khui rahmatullahi alayhi, a man comes and asks him that everything I do, everything goes wrong. Why is everything I do going wrong? He said, Khui says, do you pray? He said, yes. He says, when do you pray? He said, I pray afternoon, near Qadha time. He said, that's your problem. Pray on time. Make it a priority. And you will see Allah will open doors for you. And this man told me, he said, this minute I changed my time, at the time of Salah, everything I did in life opened up. Everything. Because the time of Salah is no longer a distraction. People say, when I pray, I'm very distracted. You know why we're distracted? Because the world is more important to us than Salah. So when we are praying, the world is distracting us. But if dhikr of Allah is more important, if remembering Allah is more important, if the Lord who created the universe is giving you a moment to come and talk to him and to knock on his door and talk to him personally, he say, Iyaka na'abudu wa iyaka nasta'een, ihdina sirat al mustaqim. The master of the day of judgment is telling you, come and talk to me. Hmm? They say, if you do that, at the time when you pray, you will find that if that dhikr is there, the world will be a distraction and salah will be the focus and our focus will be much better. But because we love the world too much and salah therefore is a distraction to us, it's something that holds us back. Therefore, we find it very difficult to pray. When in fact, a believer, a lover, of Allah loves to pray. I'll give you an example. When you, a young couple gets together, typically what do you hear? When two people just got engaged, what do you usually hear? That they are on the phone all the time. The boy is always on the phone talking to her or he's always meeting her, talking to her and she's always talking to him. He said, don't you get tired? How long do you talk? Because sometimes for hours. I said, don't you get tired? He said, no, I don't get tired. I love talking to her. It's, it's my dream. Everywhere I go, I just keep my phone with me because if she calls me, I answer. I say, you don't get tired talking on the phone? He says, no, I'm in love. I said, imagine a person who's in love with Allah. Do they ever get tired to talk to Allah? Do they ever get tired to do sujood? Do they ever get tired to do ruku? A person who understands the quality of Allah's presence when you go into ruku, when you say, subhana rabbi al azimi wa bihamdi, you are so much in love that sometimes something passes in your head. I wish I never could rise from this ruku. I wish I could remain in it forever because I'm so in love with my Lord. This is how Imam Hussein was. His love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is indescribable. That in Karbala, 72 army members, 72. Thousands, tens of thousands on the other side. Who has the time for prayer? You and I go to work and it's a little cold out there, a little busy. We say, later, we'll do salah later. How about if you're on a battlefield and heads are falling, arms are falling, blood is gushing. Do you think you and I would have time for salah? Look what Imam Hussein does. He says, we came to save salah. Look what the enemy did. Imam stays to Umar ibn Sa'ad, stop, cease fire. It's time of salah. And look what the enemy says to Imam Hussein. He says, your salah is not acceptable. 
Can you imagine the enemy is so arrogant? They have the audacity. They are so drunk in their power. They say to Imam Hussein, your salah is not acceptable. Allah said, Rukkan sujjadan yabtaguna fadla min Allah. Uridwan seemahum fi wujuhim min athar is sujood. You see signs of sujood in their face. These fools are calling our Imam at this nature. Imam says, if you're not going to stop me, if you're not going to stop this battle, then we will induct Salatul Khawf. Salatul Khawf is mentioned in the Quran. Where Allah says when you're fighting, look at Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's even given us rules of prayer, even in battle. He says, let an army pray and the other protect. You pray one raka'ah, you leave, you go fight, and the next one comes in while the leader is leading. This is how the army fights. But at that time, if you look at the numbers, 20, 30,000, and only 70 in the middle, they are just being barraged with arrows. They say, Abu Thamama, this is another man, Saeed. They were holding, they say, even, even Zuhair ibn Qayn, they held shields, shields, big shields they were holding while the Imam was behind leading Salah, and arrows were coming. My vision, what kind of animals on the other side? Who are these people? Who are these beasts? They don't have any, any care. You're not being attacked. They are praying. It's like people who don't like others to pray. They want to stop them from praying. When people tell us not to pray, when people tell us prolong your prayer, I see those arrows coming like Abu Thamama holding it. They say Abu Thamama held so much, he got so many arrows, that by the time the Imam was finishing his last rakah, he looks and breathes his last, he says, hey, Imam, have I protected you? And they say, historians say that half of Imam Hussein's army was killed in the Salah. Half. Imam didn't care because he went to fight for Salah. He came to protect Salah. Allah said, there is a time for this. If you love me, then you will prove it. You will show it. And that's why you find Imam Hussein, even in Karbala, even in his last moments, Shimr comes on top of him. Imam was in a state of sujood. He was in a state of sujood, begging, praying, thanking Allah. Let us be prayerful. Our resolution, salah. Our resolution, haya. Our resolution, generosity. Our resolution to get educated, to be wise, to be patient, to learn Islam. Let's not be ignorant. Imam didn't like ignorant people. You find after Imam Hussein Shahada, Allah says, Ya ayatun nafsul mutma'inna. Oh, whose soul is at rest. Imam Hussein, his soul was at rest. You and I see him being butchered, but he is so pleased to be with his Lord. Ya ayatun nafsul mutma'inna. Irji'i, irji'i. Irji'i ila rabbiki radiyatun mardiyya. Come back to your Lord well pleased. You have succeeded. You have Pass this exam. You have passed it beyond description. Allah says, وَرَفَعْنَا لَكَ ذِكْرَكَ Allah says to the messenger, we elevated your dhikr. We have elevated because you've passed this exam. إِرْجِي إِلَىٰ رَبِّكِ رَاضِيَةً مَرْضِيَةً فَدْخُلِي فِي عِبَادِي Look at the beautiful ayah. It says, enter among the believers. Meaning the greatest joy is not entering paradise. The greatest joy is to be among the believers who love Allah, which is paradise. So Allah Allah says, فَدْخُلِي فِي عِبَادِي وَدْخُلِي جَنَّتِي Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows us another example of these wretched people that after Imam Hussein was massacred in Karbala, this was after Asr Salah, وَالْأَصْرِ إِنَّ الْإِنسَانَ لَفِي خُسْرِ إِلَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ If you look, it's precisely what we're talking about. The religion we are talking about. The one which has the walaya of Amir al-Mu'mineen, Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam. This one. Believe me. Tawasaw bil haq. Wa tawasaw bil sabr. This is Karbala. This is Ahl al-Bayt. This is Ahl al-Bayt. You find Imam Hussain alayhi salam after being taken from this world, his head on the spear. Even little Abdullah, they dug up his grave and they took his head out. Little head, beautiful little head. What kind of a spear can carry a little head? Even then they managed to stick it up. 
How about those women to witness their beautiful children's heads on a spear? I tell you, the most despicable vision is when somebody's head is removed from their body. Our prophet has said it is forbidden for a believer ever to dismember the head of anybody. It is forbidden. Don't do that. It is forbidden. But these enemies were so wretched, they dismembered the heads. And they arranged all the heads of Qasim, Ali Akbar, Abbas, each and every member. They say Zuhair ibn Khayyim, Muslim ibn Awsaj, Muslim ibn Awsaj was Hafiz of Quran. When Muslim was fighting, the enemy stopped for a moment and said, wait, this was the man who used to teach us Quran. <laughs> this was the man who's memorized the whole Quran, Muslim ibn Awsaj, was an old man, you know. They say Uns ibn Harith was so old and he went to fight with Imam Hussein. They say his eyebrows were hanging. An old man, almost 100. He took his eyebrows and he lifted it and he tied a handkerchief around his neck so he can see. He tied a tight cloth around his back because he was an old man. He got on a horse and he went forward and he was massacred too. Even his head was up. Young children, old, all colors. And now they're digging. They've trampled Imam Hussein's body. They've cut it to pieces. They say 25 horses trampled the body of Imam Hussein. 25 bodies. <laughs> Allahu Akbar. When I see beautiful people, I see my father. And I look at his hand. I see if there's a little cut, it hurts my heart. When I see a young boy and I see he's bleeding, it cuts my heart. It, what about Imam Hussein? 25 horses trampling on his body. <laughs> then they came. It was evening time. And they started approaching the tent. And they were wild. They came poking into the tents. And the women all held themselves inside. Women, chastity, ahl al -bayt. Now they want to pull them out. The women don't want to come out. So Shimr and Ibn Ziyad says, burn it. Burn the tent. And they start lighting the tent, the fire. How do you stay in the tent? Imam Zain al-Abidin was also in the tent. And the fire started and they were all pulled outside. They were pulled outside and they were being chased. They say children were running in all directions. And Zainab salam was collecting them. <laughs> As they say, Imam Ali salam used to be very sad when he saw Zainab alayhi salam. He said, there will come a time, Zainab. You will suffer so much. There will be so much endurance on you. They say that when Zainab alayhi salam returned to her husband, Abdullah, <laughs> she knocks the door. He opens the door. He says, can I help you? She says, haven't you recognized me? Ana Zainab. <laughs> They say she had aged so much due to this grief, so much. Which mother should not age? Which human being should survive this? Which human being? But that her zeal continued until she became shaheed later in time when somebody hit her and took her soul. What you find is the tent was burnt. Everybody was pulled out. And then they took Imam Zain al-Abideen, who was the Imam, and they put chains on him. They chained him. The Imam, they put chains on him. They say the chain was heavy. And in the desert during the day when the Imam was being dragged barefoot, it was burning his hands. It was actually burning him. When I was in the Middle East, when I went for Hajj, I was standing on that sand and I could not stand. I needed slippers and I kept jumping and I said, I can't stand on this floor. And I kept moving away. I said, I can't stand this heat is too much. And a thought came into my mind. I said, what do you think of Zainul Abidin? <laughs> what do you think of him? How do you think he survived? They say they dragged him. Dragged him. The chains. From Karbala to Kufa, from Kufa all the way to Damascus, they dragged. But there's a story I conclude upon on this issue. 
that Imam Zain al Abidin was standing there as the army was preparing to leave. And one of the leaders of Yazid's army, his name was Hasin bin Numair, a wretched man, a wretched man. In fact, this man fought for Yazid, and he's one of the architects who went and burnt the Kaaba. You know, Yazid did three things in three years. First year, he killed Imam Hussein. Second year, he desecrated the Prophet's masjid. Third year, he burnt the Kaaba. Three of the most important symbols in Islam, he violated all of them, all of them. Nobody has been able to do that in history. He was the leader, Hasin bin Namir. Imam Zain al-Abidin in his chains, thirsty, hungry, sick. Hasin bin Namir had water. Imam says to Hasin, Al-Atash, <laughs> we are thirsty. Can you give us some water? Hasin in his arrogance takes the water and he spills it in front of him and says, you won't get any of this water. Imam looks at him with kindness because this is a jahil fool. He said, no problem. There comes a time. Imam Zainul Abidin, after he was released, he goes back to Medina. This same Ibn Ziyad, when being chased, took his children to Imam Zainul Abidin. Now you want to see justice? The same murderer of Karbala is being chased. He wants to save his family. He wants to save his family. Where does he take his children? He takes them to Imam Zain al Abidin in Medina. He takes them to Imam Zain al Abidin and says, These are my children, take care of them. This is the same man who butchered his children. Imagine he's bringing it to Imam Zain al Abidin. That's the wisdom and the amazing presence of our Imam. That even the enemy, as wretched as Ibn Ziyad was, he takes his children to the very family that he killed. That shows you the rahmatun lil alameen of Ahl al Bayt. Imam Zain al Abidin in the night is moving around with, with bags, bags of wheat and rice. After the shahada of Imam Hussein, you would, I would ask, if I witnessed my father being killed in that level, would I have a heart to be kind to anybody? They say Imam Zainul Abidin would walk on the street and when he would pass by a butchery and he would see all the animals slaughtered, he would turn away, he would not look at it. Because it would remind him too much of what took place. Imam Zainul Abidin, Imam Muhammad Bakr alayhi salam says, and when I washed him, he had a mark on his back. Because he carried so much weight on his back to go and feed the poor. The antithesis of these who take in orphans and they don't feed them. Our Ahl al-Bayt loved orphans, brothers and sisters. Our resolution to feed orphans. There are thousands of orphans in this world. As we speak right now in Iraq, orphans are being made. As we speak in Afghanistan, orphans are being made. As we speak all around the world, orphans are being made. Let's take care of them the most difficult state of existence is to be an orphan imam hussein's family in karbala they were all orphans all of them all as little children the women were left to have to take care of them brothers and sisters i say this to us all imam zainul abidin look at the message we need to abide by this the same hasin bin numair who spills the water the same man who was very vicious upon him imam zainul abidin was not vindictive Imam is moving in Medina in the dark of the night and Hasin now is under search because he's wandering the desert because now he's being chased because the whole Umayyad empire is crumbling and he is now thirsty and hungry. And Imam has the water and the food. So, but Imam was covered in the dark of the night like Imam Ali alayhi salam. In the dark of the night, he used to go and feed the poor. That upon his shahada, Imam Ali alayhi salam shahada, when Imam Hassan and Imam Hussein come back, they hear a quadriplegic crying. They go into the house and they say, who are you? They say, there was a man who used to come and feed me every day. There was a man who used to clean me every day. He no longer is here. That was Imam Ali. This is how our Imams were. There was a man who goes into the house of Imam Ali alayhi salam. Imam Hassan and Imam Hussein are sitting. And this man kept taking food. And he kept putting it in his pocket. Imam Hassan notices this and says to this man, if you need more food, please take it. You don't have to take it and put it in your pocket. He said, no, I'm taking it for a man up there. He's very poor. 
He said, describe me who this man is. And the description was Imam Ali alayhi salam. Imagine how Imam Ali carried himself. He never made the poor people feel bad that he was so humble in front of them. This is how he used to feed them. So Imam Zainul Abideen is one of the same. They're the same. Awalana Muhammad wa awsatuna Muhammad wa akhiruna Muhammad wa kulluna Muhammad. You find that Imam Zain al Abideen, Hasin bin Namir comes in front of him and says, Can I get some water? Imam says, Sure. Imam sees him. He knows who he is. He doesn't recognize the Imam. But Imam had a scar on his wrist from that burning of the chain. Remember we talked about? He had a scar. And Hasin remembers that. They say when the Imam started to give him, he noticed the scar on him. And as the Imam is giving him, he says, this is Imam Zain al Abidin. <laughs> they say he recognizes and he begins to cry. I'm sure even a wretched beast can cry sometimes. But that's the power of our Imams. They even invoke, they invoke tears even in the most wretched of people. And as he serves him, he says, yes, Ana Ali ibn al Hussein. But he didn't refuse him water. He gave him, and Hussein begins to cry. This is the sign of a Shia of Ahl al-Bayt. Sisters and brothers, I conclude tonight as a message. Imam Hussein's and the men's message was to go and rise and fight for Allah and to defeat the enemy on the front lines. On the back end, Zainab salam went, and the women went. They went for one main reason to hold the banner of Islam, and that banner is the hijab. You find Imam Zain al-Abideen used to complain. He said, Asham, Asham, our women were paraded. Some people say that our, the women of Imam Hussein were exposed without their hijab. I have a problem with that. Where Imam Zain al-Abideen was complaining was the women were paraded, Ahl al-Bayt were never paraded before. Their hijab, their dignity was maintained. Allah would never allow members of Ahl al-Bayt's dignity to be taken. Never. That is too precious. And you find the women, Zainab alayhi salam, when she rises and you find the flag of Islam is what the women have. This flag, sisters. There's a sister who came to me in California. She said, I never understood why God put this hijab on me. She says, I know that I need to be chaste, and I know that I'm a woman, and I need to protect the society. But I said, why did God give all that responsibility to men? I said, no, God gave you the responsibility. You are the flag bearer. Today, Islam is spreading in the world because of the hijab. This is the greatest flag, because when I travel around the world, and I see women wearing hijab, even when I travel with my own family, I find much more recognition as a Muslim with our women than if I'm alone. The world recognizes Islam through that. Jews and Christians had that also. They abandoned it. This, this, this en uh, enjoyment from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that was prescribed in the Quran fully in the Torah, even in the, in the New Testament, you find it's clear that the hijab is the flag. So Zainab alayhi salam, you notice, was not killed in Karbala, but she went as a flag bearer so let's keep this resolution upon ourselves, brothers and sisters, that the resolution of hijab, the dignity, the, the sanctity, and here's my final point. When I talk to Christian women who don't wear hijab, when I talk to Jewish women that don't wear hijab, I have seen a remarkable response, and here's my example. I once talked to a Christian woman, a good woman, and she, she came to visit me. She was not wearing proper hijab. Obviously, she doesn't believe in hijab. She doesn't believe in hijab. I started invoking love of God to her, and she became very close to God. You can sense it. She became very close to God. She suddenly started pulling her garb while she's talking to me. Every time she's talking to me, she keeps doing this. And I looked at her, and I said, this is an odd behavior. Why are you doing this in my mind? I said, God has touched her heart. Allah his presence has come into her heart and she has realized her dignity is in covering. There's something natural. Researchers have done studies. Women don't like to go to work out in gyms where men work out. They don't like it. They like to be covered. They like to be behind doors. This is not Muslim women. Women in general. 
I have witnesses with my eyes. So I say to us all, this hijab is just not an outer garb. It is when Allah's uh, uh, closeness touches a woman and a man, even a man. You find when Allah is close to my heart, I don't like to expose myself. When a woman comes to me, I don't like to look indiscriminately because Allah is close to my heart. There's a natural order. This is how Ahl al-Bayt were. So when they were exposed, Imam Zain al-Abideen complains on judgment. He says, I will complain on judgment day for what these people have done. Let us rise to that occasion that if Zainab alayhi salam, if all the women stood in Karbala to be flag bearers and they became the media and the front line messengers of Ahl al-Bayt, then let us, our women, remain that way. Sisters, please, you are the mothers of our society. Every child in our community is affected by you. You, I firmly believe, it's the mother who affects the society the most. The father is there to support, but it's the mother who instills that quality in a child. And if a mother is impure, and if a mother is exposed, she destroys the fabric of society. Zainab salam went for that reason. She went for that reason to expose the tyranny of mankind when it comes to indecency, brothers and sisters. Tonight I conclude in my lectures that we have a responsibility Remember Karbala, remember these Imams, remember this treachery that took place. It should never leave our hearts. Don't listen to anybody who says anything otherwise. But we should not just be crying all the time for the sake of crying. We cry, but we rise. Every morning I wake up, I say, Oh Allah, what can I do for that message of Imam Hussein? I love Imam Ali so much. Every day I wake up, I say, Amir al-Mu'mineen, Ali ibn Abi Talib, I love you so much. The messenger loved you so much. Give me a chance to live in your shadow. Give me the strength to be your companion. Let me be your companion on the day of judgment. Inshallah, all of us will be like that. I leave us all. That this message of Islam is beautiful. Let's practice it. Let's be good role models. Let's put our action into play. Let's make it happen. Brothers and sisters, there's a blood donation campaign. This is, these are the positive things. On Wednesday, people are donating blood. Donate blood. Go out and do something good. Start a university. Start a school. Give charity in the name of Imam Sa'ab al-Zaman. Give charity in the name of Imam Hussein. Be a witness, O oh Allah. On the day when I lived on this earth, I followed these members. These were my leaders and everybody else is not important. Hollywood is not important, brothers and sisters. They may entertain us, but they also fool us all the time. They don't know what is chastity. They don't know what is morality. These are the people who Allah has asked us to follow. May Allah bless you all. Really, you are a beautiful community. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bring tawfiq in this community. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to save these beautiful children so that they become leaders tomorrow. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to place better speakers than us up here who can deliver messages even better than us. We are just a small group of people. Oh Allah, bring them forward. We need to tell this world about the truth. We need to change. We need to become better people. And let's forgive each other. Let's ask for forgiveness for each other. We make dua for each other. And we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to have given us the opportunity to meet each other. You know, when I shake your hands, I see every handshake as a final handshake. Because I don't know if I'm going to visit your funeral or you're going to visit my funeral. Because life is that short. Let's stop the backbiting. Let's stop the bickering. Let's stop the fault, fighting, fault finding. Let's stop this. Let's stop being arrogant. Let's be humble. Let's look proactively. Let's care for each other. Let's give charity. Let's help the people who need help. And let's stop this bickering. This life is too beautiful. The imams are too beautiful. The message is too beautiful for us to waste it. Allah la'anatullah al qawm al وَسَيَعْلَمُ الَّذِينَ ظَلَمُوا أَيَّ مُنْقَلَبٍ يَنْقَلِبُونَ I thank the organizers, Sayyid Fadl, and the Al Bayt group, all of you. You've done a fantastic job. And I know the barakah for these 10, 12 nights, inshallah, will reach such people and will make them do even bigger projects. And all of us too. Let's all be supportive of each other, inshallah. Wassalamu alaikum jami'an wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.